So now we're going to talk a little bit about the source and processing, um, which will involve talking about what, what is an encounter versus a claim. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the submission and reporting requirements for the Medicare Advantage data and describe differences, uh, the resulting differences then between encounter data and fee-for-service claims data. So um, we'll also introduce chart review records and how they are different than service records because they will also be included in encounter data. And then um, some considerations for submitting claims for payment versus submitting encounters. So what does that, what does that mean? Um, the reason that we have this data available to us <laughs> is that um, in 2009, the in inpatient prospective payment rule clarified CMS's authority to require Medicare Advantage organizations um, to submit their data for each item uh, uh, provided to beneficiaries. So it's not, it hasn't been the whole time that Medicare Advantage has existed that they have been required to submit encounter data. It's just um, starting dates of service 2012 and forward. And then you may be asking, well, why is why do the research files not go back to 2012? Um, there have been challenges <laughs> for the organizations to um, submit the data. And 2015 was the first year that they um, that CMS decided that the data were of good enough quality to start um, releasing to researchers. And I mean, they really did want it to be transparent. I think that as researchers use it and ask questions, that helps uh, improve the data more. Um, and CMS knows that too. So uh, that's why they kind of they, they began releasing it in 2015. So why did CMS want to start uh, collecting encounter data? Uh, they were using it to develop and calibrate their um, hierarchical condition codes or risk adjustment models. Um, so historically, they used encounter data in addition to information submitted by the risk adjustment processing system. Um, so the RAPS system were plans kind of um, Know, analyzing their data and reporting out to CMS what um, conditions their beneficiaries had um, when they're asking for payment. Um, so because uh, plans are paid, you know, per member per month based on, you know, how much care that that member might need. Um, and the reason that the, uh, the diagnoses of the beneficiary are taken into account is because originally with managed care, uh, there was a concern that the managed care organizations would really try to um, get the healthiest people. There are the, you know, the stories of, well, they'll, they'll put the enrollment office on the second floor of a building without an elevator, right? So only people that can walk up the stairs are able to um, enroll. Uh, it's, I think, a helpful, like, visual of, you um, the idea of uh, managed care organizations trying to keep their costs low by enrolling the healthiest beneficiaries. Um, so risk adjustment is important to kind of adjust the payment. Um, and as you saw, there's not a ton of difference between uh, managed care and fee-for-service beneficiaries now. Um, so the encounter data, you know, in the beginning, they kind of used it in combination with RAPS, and now it's the main source of risk adjustment for um, deciding how to pay plans. But encounter data are also used for, you know, things like Medicare coverage evaluations, quality review and improvement, um, and research like, like we want to do. Um, so there's some more information here about um, how risk adjustment happens. So if you want some more um, uh, more information on that, you can find that there. So how is an encounter different than a claim? Remember I said in fee-for-service, a provider has provided a service to a beneficiary. They think it's a Medicare beneficiary, so they send a request for payment to Medicare. Medicare verifies that this person is covered by them and then sends a payment. You know, they may they may do some adjudication where they're, you know, quibbling on, you know, what what should be billed and how it's billed, but um, by and large, and, and actually we get to see most of that in the claims data, we get to see a final action, the final action of what CMS decided, um, what was billed and how much CMS is paying for the, for the service, uh, whether or not CMS denied the service, um, we get that information from claims. Um, an encounter on the other hand, uh, the plans aren't asking CMS for a payment for each of these services. They're just reporting that a service happened. Um, 
and they're documenting the diagnoses that the beneficiaries have in order to perform that risk adjustment calculation, as well as the services. It's not a direct record of payment transactions. As I mentioned, if a plan is paying their providers on a capitated basis, they might not even pay on a service level basis. They're just, you know, they might also be, the provider might just be receiving a per member per month um, uh, payment. So um, this isn't a direct record of payment transactions. It's a report out. And depending, I think some of that, um, some of the issue with the plan submitting their encounters to CMS in the beginning was, you know, well, how are we going to translate what we're doing into, a, you know, into what CMS is asking for. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, and they're not a record of payments, but they are of services provided regardless of the final payment decision. So that also means that, um, you know, a service was provided. We don't know what the payment was or whether it was paid at all, um, but we do know that the service should have happened if it's in the encounter data. Um, in general, all plan types, grouped as managed care, are required to submit encounter records. So that includes, you know, the health maintenance preferred provider organizations. They are to submit all items and services provided under the plan, regardless of the payment status. So even if it was denied, it should be sent to us. Um, the downside is, you know, we don't get a lot of information then as researchers of um, the denial status because we don't have payments. Um, it includes the Medicare services only and not Medicaid. So for uh, someone who was enrolled in a DSNP, um, if uh, that DSNP is helping pay for a long-term care, which is not covered under Medicare, then that shouldn't be submitted into the encounter data processing system on this side. It could be submitted to the Medicaid program. Um, Cost plans are a type of plan I didn't really talk about. They've been phased out, but if you're looking in the data 2019 and prior, um, and I think there might still be some legacy cost plans, um, but by and large, they are done away with, but they are kind of a hybrid between Medicare Advantage and fee-for-service, and they um, are only required to submit the data for the Medicare items for which the plans claim <laughs> the CMS Medicare costs on their cost reports. So, um, if cost plans, I think typically will um, will pay for uh, one part of Medicare and not the other, and so they they're only going to report into the encounter data system what they're covering, um, and and then the beneficiary would receive from the fee for service program the other the other services, and those so those would be found in the fee for service files. For something like the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, they would submit records for Medicare covered items and services. So they have all-inclusive care, they have some things that Medicare doesn't cover, they would only be submitting for what Medicare does cover. And um, now Medicare Medicaid plans are a special kind of plan. Um, they are supposed to be sub um, separating their Medicare and Medicaid into different files based on which program traditionally pays for services. So. Um, that probably can get a little bit messy, but um, how is the data submitted? And it is, uh, CMS asked the managed care organizations to put their, their information into the same forms as the fee-for-service claims, which is a help to us as researchers because we end up with a lot of similar variables to look at. Um, they don't always mean the same thing as they meant in fee-for-service because um, some of it is maybe how the plan interprets it. When they're not submitting for payment, there's not the same um, you know, level of required, um, level of detail required or level of accuracy required for some of the fields. Uh, but there is one form for institutional services in which, um, you know, there's uh, like if there's a hospital stay, they will say this person was admitted and discharged, that they kind of fill out that information. They kind of give information on different things that happened during this day. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but um, revenue center detail and um, the plan, no matter how they received their data from their providers is asked to put it into these, um, these forms. And it, it's not unlikely that they probably did receive it from the providers in these forms, but they might not be using all of the fields in the same way. 
Okay, and then the required data elements um, used to be called minimum data elements. They're required for submission in order to in order to properly process the encounter data. So provide who is the provider? Um, what are the diagnosis and procedures? What are the dates associated with the service? Um, you know, wh where did the service happen? Um, Sometimes there's information collected by the encounter data processing system that doesn't get translated to the research files and payments is an example of that. Um, CMS does collect the payment information, but they just have, um, they right now do not um, provide it to researchers. Uh, there's the encounter data submission and processing guide is um, available and you can look back at previous years if you need to. Um, it gives a lot of information about how the um, how the encounter data are received, some you know very specific information about what to do in X Y Z situation. Um, if you're working in the fee for service side, we always recommend you use the Medicare claims processing manuals. <laughs> They're very helpful to know how CMS is asking something to be billed, you know, in order to be paid. Um, we don't have that kind of information for Medicare Advantage because each plan has its own way of doing that. Um, but we do have this encounter data submission and processing guide. It's, you know, how is CMS asking the data to be sent? Um, maybe it's not always being sent that way. CMS does um, give plans feedback on, you know, how how well they, they seem to be doing based on some metrics. Um, but uh, that, re that manual is, is helpful. So when the research files are created, um, you know, the providers are sending to the managed care organizations, which send to the encounter data system. And then it goes to the chronic conditions data warehouse or the CCW. You may have um, heard of them, especially if you have the data, that's where you get your data from. Um, and they are the ones that uh, are processing the encounter data files for researchers. Um, and they provide the inpatient, outpatient, home health, skilled nursing facility carrier and um, durable medical equipment files. And again, they will look very similar in structure to the fee-for-service files, but they don't necessarily have all the same fields, um, but the fields will be named similarly. Uh, one major difference between encounter data and fee-for-service data is the inclusion of chart reviews. So encounters are records of interactions between the Medicare Advantage beneficiary and the health system and a way of reporting on the care needs of beneficiaries. So it's a way for the plan to communicate to CMS, this person has this condition and that's, you know, makes it more costly to care for them. So the service records are actual services that are provided. And then the chart review records are if um, the plan goes back into the medical record and says, oh, there's actually something that didn't show up on that service record that we want to make sure gets communicated to CMS, they will add a chart review record. Um, and Becky will be talking more about these uh, in her segment, so stay tuned for that. But um, they are uh, medical record reviews, and they're performed for the validation of diagnoses submitted on encounter records and for the risk score adjustment. They are submitted using, um, using the same form um, as, as we have, so they're kind of forced into the... Um, those billing forms, even though they're just a report of diagnoses, but they do end up having lots of different fields filled. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and they must be supported by the medical record. So if CMS went back and said, can you prove it? They should be able to, to prove that a uh, beneficiary has this diagnosis. And it gives the opportunity for managed care organizations to add or remove diagnoses identified in the medical record that are different from what was reported on the encounter, the service record, um, and, and to provide more complete information. Um, you may have seen in the news that um, some plans take more advantage of this than others, and uh, in order to increase the payments they receive from CMS. So um, it is an active area of CMS's interest to look at these chart reviews, um, and they are available to us on our files but they are something that we have to decide how we want to handle them. Do we want to, do we care if a diagnosis has been added in a chart review? Um, if we do care, then how are we going to incorporate that information into our studies? Um, 
In terms of adjudication, this is a claims processing term that we use, you know, when we're talking about fee-for-service data, we say, well, the provider sends a claim to CMS, CMS, you know, looks at it and says, well, you can't, that, that billing isn't quite right. You know, then they send it back to the provider and they go back and forth until a final decision has been made and the claim has been paid. Um, in terms of the adjudication for encounter records, the adjudication happens at the plan. So any fully adjudicated claim, whether it's accepted or denied, should be submitted by plans to the encounter data system. Um, and if they if they happen to submit a claim that later was you know needed to be replaced, they can they can you know send a replacement claim. Um, the upshot of this is that we end up we can end up with multiple records, um, one that would have each update to the record. So Becky will be talking a little bit more about what that looks like in the files. Uh, there is something called a final action flag in the encounter data. When we look at the fee-for-service claims data, we always say what you're getting there is final action claims. So it means after the claim has gone back and forth and been adjusted and adjudicated, um, whatever CMS's final action is on the claim is what is in the file. And all adjustments are rolled up. Um, into one record, which contains the full payment or whether, it, you know, if, if it was denied, it contains the denial information. For encounter data, um, what they mean for final action is really the latest version of the record that was submitted. Um, it's not necessarily the final action. CMS hasn't adjudicated it to make sure that it's the final action. Um, there is something called a final action indicator. Uh, and that will always be, so there, there are actually two variables. There's one, um, at least in the inpatient file, that says this is the latest version and this is the final action. Um, those always match. So if it's if it says it's the latest version, it, it will say, yes, this is the final action. Um, so you could use either one of those variables. Sometimes there are dates of service in, like, in the inpatient file that have no record with a final action flag. Um, oftentimes these are oddly records that are only chart reviews. There's no service attached to them. Um, and so uh, just something to look out for. And some encounters may have multiple records that are flagged as final action. Uh, different years of the data, I think this is becoming less common, but um, it's difficult to use that flag, I guess I would say. But it is one way you could um, use to kind of just at least find this is the latest, latest version of this record. Uh, denied claims for fee-for-service, they are included in the data. Um, we don't, um, when we when we talk about how to think about denied claims, you know, we, we don't get to see claims that the providers never sent to be denied. So that's just one thing to note. But, um, but if they did send a claim and um, there will be a Medicare payment equal to zero, there are some indicator variables that can give you information about um, how the, you know, why the claim was denied. They're usually kind of not specific, but, um, but there is information. With the encounter data, we don't really have information about um, whether or not the claim was denied, but they are supposed to be submitting denied claims. And we don't have payment information to see, you know, that this was a zero cost. Um, but uh, even if we had payment information, that probably wouldn't help us because individual services may be zero cost under a capitated model, for example. So um, so how are we going to decide if I'm telling you that a service could have multiple yeah, records, well, boom, heart disease, uh -huh. line, um, we don't have a standard methodology. Uh, some of it will depend on the goals of your research. Are you trying to count services? Um, are you trying to, you know, how many physician visits did someone have? Or do you just want to know does you know how many people have a certain diagnosis? Uh, you might make different decisions. You know, if you're looking for diagnoses and you want to um, include chart reviews, maybe because that would give kind of more information. Um, and you know, as we go through, as researchers use this more and document what they what they're doing and how they're working with things, um, then our methods will evolve over time. There, one other thing to note, uh, you may have seen that right now the um, the encounter preliminary file for 2022 is available, so you could request it. Um, 
this is just an example from 2021. When uh, when the 2021 dates of service in sorry, in spring of 2023, we released the preliminary file for the encounter records for 2021 dates of service. Um, sorry, in June of 2023 is when they were released. They were created in the spring. Um, this is because the plans have a certain amount of time to submit their encounters, and they also have a, a kind of a preliminary deadline and a final deadline to submit their encounters for the risk adjustment. And um, so for 2021, even though the preliminary file was released in June, the submission window for plans closed um, in July. And then a final file was released to researchers in December of 2023. And this is intended to be a replacement for the preliminary file. So you don't have to figure out, you know, how am I going to combine these two and, you know, look to see which one is, you know, <laughs> which record am I keeping, that sort of thing. It's just intended to be a full replacement. So um, you can use that to, um, so if you wanted to request the preliminary file and start an analysis and then receive the final file to, you know, solidify what you've done, or a lot of researchers maybe just wait until the final file. Uh, if you were going to try to generalize encounter data, um, comparing it to fee-for-service claims, we have multiple considerations, right? Um, fee-for-service claims do not have any chart review mechanism. So you might want to say, well, maybe I'm just going to remove all the chart reviews from the encounter data. Uh, there is some deduplication that's necessary for fee-for-service claims. You know, a hospital stay may plan, may span multiple claims. And so you want to make sure that you're not counting the same one twice, but um, there's definitely more, more things to do with the encounter data. Um, and if you want to compare even diagnoses, you know, after we've learned that diagnoses are very important for, um, for the risk adjustment process, you may find that the coding intensity is higher for Medicare Advantage. And um, I think I'm going to get the date wrong, um, but MedPAC has a report on coding intensity. It might have even been March of this year, March 2024, um, where you can, uh, they've got some findings on that. Uh, diagnoses are important for payment of claims and providers try to make sure to include the diagnoses that will, you know, ensure them proper payment, um, you know, as high of a payment as they can get. If they, if someone has a lot of comorbidities, they will be included on the claims. Um, but just the fact that there are different incentives and the chart review mechanism may in increase the coding intensity of diagnosis code. So something to be aware of. Um, payments are also not present in the encounter data. So um, that will that could be a challenge if you're um, you know, wanting to calculate differences in payments. But uh, Peter will be talking later about some options that uh, people have used. And then um, there are some CMS specific provider identifiers like the cert CMS certification number that are not present in the encounter research files because they're not sending their bills to CMS. They don't need to include these um, CMS provider identifiers. The bummer <laughs> with the CCN is that it gives, it's a, um, it's designed to give information about the type of facility. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about how that pans out in the inpatient file because there could be multiple different facilities that are um, accommodating inpatient stays. And the um, identifier that is available on the encounter data, the NPI, doesn't have any of that information built into it. So you have to do a little bit more work. But, um, you know, encounter data likely captures most services provided to MA enrollees. We'll talk this afternoon about some of the things we've done to look at it. Um, other researchers have been looking into it. MedPAC's been looking into it, um, trying to find a good comparator source to say, do we think that Encounter Data has you know, everything? So, um, and different plans have different levels of completeness. CMS is continuing to work with them. They give them report cards based on different benchmarks that they have set. Um, and uh, we hope that the data will just keep improving, you know, and researchers using the data, I think, is also helpful because they can give feedback to CMS. Um, as risk adjustment now has become more reliant on encounter data, I think the, um, that will improve it as well. Uh, so, um, 
think we're it has improved over time. We'll talk a little bit more about how that about that in the afternoon, but um, it should can continue to improve. Uh, the CMS's Customer Service and Support Center, um, CSSC uh, website, they um, you can look. There's a topic for encounter and risk adjustment program. That's where you can find the encounter data submission and processing guide. They are really designed to be interacting with the plans. Um, and so they have a lot of information on their website about different, um, there's even FAQs that they have that are sometimes very helpful for understanding uh, how things are showing up. So that would be some place to look if you have questions about something you're seeing in the data um, and can also always email ResDeck. And then I, I keep plugging the MedPAC reports to Congress, but they've um, been doing a, you know, uh, in-depth look at encounter data over the years, and they typically have a lot of really good information in there. So I uh, recommend their reports as well. 